In this video, I would like to talk about, you guessed it, cheating. In particular, a form of cheating that has come to be known as contract cheating, although the issue of academic dishonesty in general is certainly relevant here. I have compiled a collection of footage that covers this form of cheating. After the footage, I discussed a variety of ways to combat cheating and why they seem to fall short. I also raised the question of whether academic cheating should be publicized and whether this would resolve the issue. At Birmingham City University, computing lecturers Thomas Lancaster and Bob Clark have for years been researching the growth of a phenomenon they call contract cheating. Contract cheating is where a student uses a third party to produce original work for them. And one of the main ways they do that are by using online companies called essay mills. More than half of American teens have admitted to cheating in school. For some, the pressure to succeed supersedes any moral or ethical code of conduct. But there might be more cheaters out there than you ever imagined. The nonprofit Josephson Institute in Los Angeles surveyed more than 20,000 students nationwide for its 2012 report card on the ethics of American youth. 49% said they never cheat. 51% admit to cheating at least once and more than half of those said they cheated two or more times. The same survey asked if a person has to lie or cheat sometimes to succeed. 64% said no, but 36% said yes. It's become a cultural toxicity. In other words, that, that this notion of cheating being something that's acceptable, that you can get away with. By some estimates, nearly 70% of college students say they've cheated. We turned to the honors program at Hofstra University, where we asked five professors with experienced eyes if we ordered a paper for one of their exams, could they tell the difference? So all three of these papers look like papers you would get. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, one of the professors actually put the paper through scanning software used by so many universities that looks for plagiarism. Right. The results? Everything here is correct. 63% of college kids admit to cheating, and these days it's easier than ever. Now kids are paying strangers for customized papers, original work. So who are these ghostwriters? And are the papers any good? That's Alex. His term paper ad promises a quick turnaround and years of experience. Check out this next writer, Pete. His ad brags, above average grade guaranteed while you sleep through class. Alex charges $140. Pete's price, $90. Ethics aside, we wondered, were their papers any good? We have our professor read them both. She gives Alex a C minus. Pete gets a B. Turns out that there are dozens of websites you can use to purchase papers for school. So we did it, and we brought this paper to a college professor to see if she could tell it was purchased, and if so, what would she do about it? If this had been turned into me by one of my students, I would be sorely disappointed. Then you would give this an F? I would uh, actually give it a zero because of the fabricated resources. The part that's hard. A 19-year-old college student named Sam Eshigoth made national news when he was arrested and charged with fraud and criminal impersonation. His crime was taking the SAT and ACT tests for other people. I would call him an academic gun for hire. My parents got a phone call saying that there was a warrant for my arrest. Nassau County District Attorney Kathleen Rice filed criminal charges against Eshigoff and the students who hired him. This was a, a huge fraud from my perspective. This was a uh, lots of money exchanging hands. There were high stakes involved. And there was forgery. There was criminal impersonation. That's a fraud. It's a fraud on many different levels. Uh, but most importantly, against the kids who play by the rules. There are three general ways of modifying behavior concerning the desire to cheat. The bottom-up approach, the top-down approach, and the reason-responsive approach. I'm going to briefly discuss these approaches and some problems with them. Then I'll end with a proposal. Let's begin with the bottom-up approach. The basic premise is that behavior is determined largely by upbringing such that Good and bad behavior can be located in the history of a person's character, which is to say, the internalized values, beliefs, and attitude that guides an individual's conduct. And from this, it is argued that good behavior, such as academic honesty, 
can be brought about by modifying the early character of a person to education and early childhood engagement. An example of this would be the Philosophy for Kids program, which promotes critical thinking in young children. Next up is the top-down approach. Now, the basic premise here is that behavior is determined largely by sticks and carrots, such that good behavior can be motivated by carrots or desire for rewards, and bad behavior can be motivated by sticks or fear of punishment. This is essentially a consequence-based approach. Here it is argued that behavior can be modified by modifying the consequences of actions. An example of this would be the penalties that a college imposes for students who are caught cheating, ranging from a zero for the assignment, an F for the entire course, or even expulsion from the university. The final approach is the reason responsive approach. The basic premise to this practice is that human beings are responsive to reason and that if you provide an individual with good reasons for performing or avoiding certain actions, then they will act according to those reasons because they are responsive to reasons. This is often accomplished by getting students to critically evaluate the practice of cheating by examining reasons for and against it. The thought is that if students think critically about cheating, then they will see that the reasons for cheating are no good and will therefore modify their behavior accordingly. Now let's discuss some problems with these three approaches, beginning with the bottom-up approach. It requires a long-term view of human growth and development that sees early education as an investment, and people are suspicious of education which targets values precisely because they suppose that this sort of education is too much like brainwashing, and in any case, it doesn't help us with the current generation of students who cheat. Now the top-down approach. It works for some, but not all, and maybe not even most students. If consequences of the sort imposed by colleges were actually effective, then no one would cheat. But clearly, people do cheat. And, as you saw in the videos, a lot of people cheat quite often. So, the top-down approach, at least in the way it's being done, doesn't seem to discourage cheating. Peer pressure, the pressure to succeed academically, and the belief that I'm too smart to get caught, seem to overwhelm the desire to behave appropriately. Finally, the reason-responsive approach assumes, as Socrates did, that if a person knows the right thing to do, then that person won't fail to do it. However, if that were true, then no one would speed or litter or break any laws. After all, the people who are speeding, littering, cheating, and so forth knows that speeding, littering, cheating, and so on are wrong, but they did it anyways. Therefore, the reason-responsive approach is probably too optimistic. So here's the conclusion. Maybe we need to tweak one of these three approaches to cheating in order to be more effective at discouraging cheating and encouraging honest academics. Here's one suggestion, which, for the lack of a better description, we can call the Scarlet F approach. Here's the basic premise. People tend to dislike it when their misconduct is made public and are absolutely horrified at the prospect of their misconduct being made public on the internet. So here's the question. Should there be a Scarlet F website that publishes the names of students who commit academic misconduct in colleges? Would it be effective? That is to say, would the prospect of having your name published on a Scarlet F website discourage academic cheating? What are the reasons for it and against it? Which reasons are stronger? As always, thank you for your kind attention. Take care. Thank you.